Hi, everyone. We're going to start our panel discussion on something that's very near and dear to my heart that I love just as much as I love compression stockings, and that's sclerotherapy. My first love is sclerotherapy. Um, I've been with CVR uh, for two years and have been doing sclerotherapy for 13, and I'm joined uh, with Dr. Sean Stewart, um, who is the director of chemical ablations with CVR. So our first presenter I'm honored to... Um, to uh, introduce you to. He's a board certified uh, dermatologist, uh, Dr. Mishra. Uh, thank you for inviting me, uh, Peter, Sanjeev, CVR family and so forth. It's an honor to be here, my first time. Caught the last flight out from Texas last night. My flight was canceled, so got the last ticket on American, so I'm glad to be here. Um, so we'll talk about sclerotherapy, and this is a, a very essential topic. Um, and they gave me 10 minutes. So we'll try to be very efficient with our time. Um, and if you have any questions, I'll be around. So please find me. Um, but I may peace out, catch a flight to the airport sooner, who knows. All right, let's get started. So we'll talk about visual sclerotherapy, um, move forward, a couple of disclosures on the board for the AVLS and phlebology and also for the ABVLN as well. So let's talk about sclerotherapy in general. Uh, the principles, you want to start at the uh, highest point of reflux and then treat the largest vein going out to the smaller veins. You wanna treat the entire vessel itself in its entirety. Uh, compression is needed during and after the treatment. And that itself is a big topic um, in terms of how long and, and for how and how much. Uh, the patient should be able to ambulate afterwards. Uh, if they cannot, it may increase the risk of uh, thrombosis. In terms of the potential targets for sclerotherapy, uh, there's different types, foam and liquid. Um, of course, for liquid sclerotherapy, the smaller veins is more amenable. Uh, if you're treating a larger vein, then foam sclerotherapy can be used. I think our next speaker will be talking about foam sclerotherapy, so I'll defer some of the topics on foam. So in terms of sclerosins, uh, there's a few on the market and there's quite a few worldwide. We'll focus what's here in the US. We have uh, polydopinol, STS, uh, hypertonic saline, and glycerin. In terms of the sclerosins, all of them have complications. They can vary from hyperpigmentation to matting to phlebitis, PE, DVT, and tissue necrosis as well. So STS was approved in 1946. It was discontinued and brought back in 2004. It has been sold as a stock solution of 3%, which can be diluted down. STS is a detergent, therefore it can be turned into a foam. Uh, the most common side effects include hyperpigmentation and matting based on the patient's skin type. However, if you do happen to extravasate, you can get tissue necrosis at higher concentrations. Polydocanol was approved in March of 2010, also uh, called sclera, the brand name. It's, rel it's relatively painless upon injection, very rare cases of necrosis, uh, like STS is a detergent, therefore can be turned into a foam as well. And it's very versatile, can be used both for smaller veins as well as larger veins. Hypertonic saline uh, is not FDA approved. Uh, but the principal advantage of this product is that it is naturally occurring. Therefore, there should be no allergy. Um, it is fairly painful upon injection. It's mostly prepped as, as a 23.4% solution. Uh, some may offer lidocaine, which will make it less painful and drop the percentage to 19% in terms of its, um, its concentration. Um, but once again, this is off-label. Um, I do think that there is risk involved because there are some um, legal issues if something were to go downhill with the patient. Glycerin, uh, most commonly prepped as a 72% glycerin mixed with lidocaine. This is also off-label. Um, it is ideal for smaller veins. The advantage is that there's less risk for matting and hyperpigmentation. And once again, uh, it's a slow injection, so therefore the risk for extravasation is low, uh, but ideal for the smaller veins. Um, there's also a chromated form as well that can be found for glycerin. So the goal for sclerotherapy is to deliver the minimum volume and, con and concentration of your sclerosin that will cause damage to the, to the vessel wall. And more is not better in this case. So how do you know what is the ideal concentration that one should be using? Well, there's no, really, there's no real simple formula, uh, but I do have a table that kind of lists the various vessel sizes and appropriate concentrations that can be used. This over here is for liquid sclerotherapy. Of course, if you're using foam, that can change your dynamics because it's more potent and also has other uh, risk as well based upon the vessels you're trying to treat. 
What's the maximum dosage that can be used in one setting? Well, there's not really um, strong or hard data showing that if you did 30 cc's versus 10 versus 15, um, I was trained using 10 cc's per session. Uh, Mitch Goldman uh, does about 20, 25. Um, I do less because I like to sleep at night and have less concern. Uh, technique. Uh, so each person, each um, physician or nurse may have their own style. I always take pictures, consent. You want to prep the patient, have them lie flat. I use a three cc syringe. If you use one that is uh, too small, then sometimes you can cause too much pressure that can cause the vein to blow. Uh, I use a 30 gauge needle. I bend the needle and inject with a bevel up. And I am right-handed, so I use my right hand to inject. Uh, I rest my pinky finger on the patient's leg. So if they were to move, I move with the patient. And I use my non-dominant hand to stretch the skin. And basically I go in and I inject. And once I know I'm done, I just move on to the next site. Or you can have your nurse or your assistant help to uh, stretch the skin if you are lucky to have extra staffing. So technique wise, you wanna inject almost parallel into the skin. This is a good illustration showing how the needle is bent with the bevel up. And you wanna only inject when you know that you're actually in the vessel. So do not inject blindly, obviously. This is just a little movie I filmed. This is the vein light, just kind of mapping out. Here we're doing foam sclerotherapy, therapy, three to one rate, a ratio of polydocanol. Um, and once again, you wanna treat the larger vessels, watch it kind of feed through. This movie has been sped up. Uh, so please don't inject this quickly or else uh, that may cause problems. Um, but in the interest of time, we have to move things faster. Uh, that's your compression stocking with the, with the donor as well. So anyways, point being is that you wanna watch the flow of the sclerosant. You wanna massage the site to make sure that it is actually in the vein and being moved properly through the veins. Uh, if you do form a bleb, it means that you're not actually injecting into the vessel. Stop, just move on to the next site. Uh, no reason to, to keep injecting. Uh, some people like to use a convolution tape uh, just so that this way there's less bleeding and there's some pressure applied to that site. Technique, uh, the patient should have their compression hose with them prior to the treatment. If they don't and you forget to ask, you can do an ACE wrap, but ideally they should have their compression stockings and you or your staff member should be the one placing it prior to them standing up or sitting up because the abdominal pressure will reopen the veins and therefore you wanna make sure that you can have the best outcome and make sure they have their stockings on prior to them actually getting up and off the table. So a few more po pointers, you wanna avoid a high injection pressure because you will probably blow through the vein and you could even push into the arterial circulation. You wanna treat the larger veins to the smaller veins and you wanna use appropriate concentration for the size of the vessel. If you're treating a larger reticular vein, sometimes it may, re may require a second treatment. If you do have a palpable thrombus, I tell the patients that's a good sign, not a bad sign. And that can be removed um, by just simply uh, putting a nick into the skin um, and just draining it after two or three weeks. This is especially important for patients who have more of a tan complexion because you will get hyperpigmentation um, that will persist for a long period of time. So we can kind of move through this. So, vi so visual aids, I actually use a vein gauge uh, when I first started just because this way it helped me to measure the size of the veins. At some point you might become uh, very astute and will not need one. Um, you have different types of vein lights. There's one that you can plug into the wall versus one that you can keep in your pocket. Um, the one that you plug in the wall is very nice, very bright, but uh, it has to be close to the power source. Um, but the other pocket size is nice as well. Um, in terms of uh, headlamps, uh, having the, the Cirrus headlamp is helpful for me, at least. I think that it gives me a better contrast and therefore I can have um, a better uh, rate of injection into the vessel itself. Uh, there you can see what it looks like with and without the uh, polarized light. So as you can see with the polarized light, it gives you more contrast and therefore um, you can easierly find the vein. Uh, lasers versus sclerotherapy. So sclerotherapy is your primary way of treatment for the uh, for small veins. I use a laser to go and clean up veins. You can use, uh, there's different subtypes, kind of it's beyond the scope of this talk, but a pulse dye laser or KTP 532. If you're treating a patient who is pigmented or has pigment in their skin or is tanned or is a deeper vein, then the NDAG 1064 is what you wanna use. Uh, a laser treatment is obviously more time consuming can be painful, especially if you're using a long pulse NDAG. Um, but it's really nice because therefore you can 
easily clean up those small vessels. Um, or you can use the Van Gogh. Uh, I actually don't even have this, but I was told to bring this up in the talk. So anyways, it's almost like a cautery type device helps to go in and treat those vessels, kind of poor man's laser, you can call it. Um, anyways, thank you for your time. Uh, this is where I did my training and uh, I appreciate in the invite today. Thank you. Next, we have our very own Dr. Nick Morrison to talk a little bit about the Tassari method of foam versus Varathena. Uh, so I am gonna talk about Varathena and uh, physician compounded foam. My disclosure slide, again, the Grand Canyon. So indications for foam sclerothapories for essentially for any great, any saphenous vein, the veins of Giacomini, uh, cranial extensions and persistently incompetent perforators. You can also use it as adjunctive treatment following foam uh, endovenous thermal ablation and neovascularity is really uh, treated very well with foam. It's a nice image. You can also do it with a catheter directed, so you can put a long catheter into the saphenous vein and then uh, instill tumescent anesthesia. The results of that by Atilio Cavizzi uh, is that it's, it, it, it ends up being a little bit better. So he looked at 80, 88 limbs, uh, treated them, and uh, hang on, let me go back. Uh, had very high occlusion rates. You see, almost 90% uh, at three years is a very good occlusion rate. It's probably better than you can do just with the uh, foam sclerotherapy alone. Uh, there may be some uh, uh, some difference of opinion with this uh, with this study, but uh, uh, the the study that followed up didn't use uh, vasoconstricting agents, and that's probably important to get those results. Uh, then uh, this is a study also from Kovici, fifty patients treated two groups, one with uh, ultrasound guided and one with catheter directed. Uh, at, at 28 days, only 36% of that ultrasound guided alone were closed and 80% of the group B or the catheter directed with tumescent anesthesia. Uh, they did allowed another session and then it came up to uh, parity with the two groups. So let's talk about uh, efficacy and uh, safety. This is Ken Meyer's patient. It's an older study, but it's uh, one of the really true uh, uh, real world studies. He got a uh, assisted uh, primary closure rate of 77% after 36 years. And those are real world, real, real world results from a very, very reliable source. And then this is uh, Katie Derval's paper, five to eight year results from uh, Andrew Bradbury's group. Uh, they had. Uh, AV, the AVSS scores were improved in almost 90% of the patients with high satisfaction. And the important thing is also they had less than 15% recurrence rates. So they concluded that it was highly effective and that, that less than 15% requiring treatment is pretty impressive. And then surgery versus laser versus ultrasound guided foam sclerotherapy. When you compare open surgery and uh, laser, the results are equivalent in terms of the quality of life, but there's significantly higher residual rate saphenous reflux at 12 months, but uh, the, it seemed to not make any difference, at least at that one year interval. And then we'll talk about Varathena a bit. Varathena is indicated for great saphenous or accessory saphenous veins, not small saphenous veins, and uh, visible varicosities. It has been shown to uh, improve the symptoms and the appearance of varicosities. This is a Vanish 2 trial, conclusions of which were uh, the treatment with the polydocanol foam uh, led to durable, clinically meaningful, and uh, ongoing improvements at one year in comparison to a placebo, but not to physician compounded foam. So I'll talk a little bit about foam safety. These are some of the side effects and adverse events that you probably all are familiar with and have uh, perhaps seen in your practice. This is a, a, a study showing that the mean incidence of DVT was 0 0.4 to 5.7, and this is homemade foam. And then Jean-Luc Gillet's paper of 1,000 patients, side effects of 2.6% with migraine, visual disturbances, and chest pressure. Uh, that's, that's pretty good. These, um, we think, however, that these uh, neurosensory events are probably related to the release of endothelin one with endothelial destruction. Uh, they are pro they are certainly not transient ischemic attacks, but correspond to migraines with the release of the endothelin one, which passes through a right to left shunt and uh, spreads over the cerebral cortex. 
This is, if you haven't seen this, metal, this uh, demonstration before, that's an injection of a one millimeter vein in the calf with one cc of foam. Next uh, image, if I can get it to go, there it is. Down at the left, now you can see bubbles in less than 10, 10 seconds in the heart. So if you think your foam is staying where it's uh, where you think it is, it's not. And that's a transcranial Doppler we did at the same time, showing that hits occur very rapidly. If we had sound, I, you, I, I would show you those. So is there anything you can do to prevent this foam migration? You can stand on your own head if you want to. It's not gonna make any difference at all. I'm kind of impressed that I actually pulled that off a few years ago. <laughs> um, neurologic complications, they shouldn't be minimized, but they generally are very short-lived. Migraine-like symptoms are uncommon and strokes are incredibly rare in the world literature. An intraarterial injection, however, is a flat-out disaster. Avoid that at all costs. You're gonna end up with an amputation. It just depends on where. Now, this is a, a study, again, from uh, Jean-Luc Gillet. Uh, looking at the re recanalizations of great saphenous veins in a three-year follow-up, this is interesting because what they found was if the vein, the, and they didn't treat people for, for that period of time for a whole year, if the vein at the time they found it was open, three millimeters, varicose veins associated and symptomatic, they would retreat that. But if it was less than three millimeters in size, not symptomatic and not associated with varicose veins, they left it alone. Uh, things that you can do to avoid these neurosensory events, probably most of them don't help much, but uh, limitations on foam volume, a low si silicone syringe and non-air-based foam are probably some of the ones that can help. Uh, this is our uh, work from several years ago, uh, showing that the use of non-air-based non -based foam had a lower risk of chest tightness, dry cough and dizziness, and visual disturbances were also less. This is a paper from Takashi Yamaki, which uh, advocates for small volume, uh, frequent injections rather than large volume, infrequent injections. Essentially, more foam got into the deep system with a large volume, fewer injections. A couple of patients had some migraine symptoms in that group, and there wasn't any difference in the success. Uh, so syringe volume may make a difference. This is a, a, a comparison of a 30 C and a 30 cc and a 2 cc syringe. There was increased uh, volume caused the bubble diameter to increase if you have that big syringe and it's better to use a small, small syringe. Uh, if you're worried about subcutaneous injection, you come out of the vein and you mistakenly uh, inject subcutaneous tissue with the foam, don't worry about it. It's, it's not gonna cause any problems. I've never seen a problem with that. Uh, Tassari method, uh, STS is injected in the distal great saphenous vein. Uh, this is this uh, Lorenzo Tassari's work showing that this foam, the, the active sclerosant on foam is very, very rapidly inactivated, less than eight seconds. There has been one report of anaphylactic shock uh, using the STS, so it's extremely uncommon, but it can occur. Uh, test doses are probably not worthwhile because there's even an uh, anaphylactic reaction from a test dose. Uh, the safety trials that the uh, Verathena has undergone, about 1,300 patients in 12 different trials, the DVT rate was higher than you, uh, you might expect or might, might think is appropriate. Most of these, however, were clinically insignificant. These patients were looked at very, very carefully, and uh, they found an increased risk of DVT. Uh, and then SVT was the most common complication. These neurosensory events is interesting because on Verathena, they had a 2.7% incidence of some of these uh, uh, adverse events, but 4% in a placebo group. So they're very subtle sometimes and hard to tease out. The, uh, uh, it may be, it may, so this is a study where they had 80, 80 patients, 82 patients, 60 of whom had a documented right to left shunt. They look for, very carefully look for MRI findings, uh, indicative of in brain injury or uh, cardiac troponin levels, and they didn't find any in any of those 60 patients, indicating it's pretty, pretty safe. Uh, bubble size, you want the bubbles as small as you, you can possibly get. Uh, this is a real nice study from Mike Watkins. So he took office workers to make foam and, uh, and uh, compared them to 
people who were really experienced and found that essentially that most of the bubbles that they produced were less than 12 microns, most of them all were less than 100 microns. And that's a really uh, ideal for the treatment of fo for foam varicose veins. So in conclusion, uh, this is a safe uh, procedure. There are a few short-lived and mild side effects and very infrequent or rare significant complications. Is, a pan is foam sclerotherapy a panacea? Probably not, but it's very, very useful. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll hear from Dr. Calcagno from our Mechanicsburg Clinic, and he'll be talking about uh, optimizing your vis visual sclerotherapy results. When I saw the program and I saw I'd be following Dr. Misha and Dr. Morrison, I realized there wouldn't be much left that would be unsaid about sclerotherapy, and I turned out I was right. Um, so I thought I would just tell you how I perform cosmetic or visual sclerotherapy. I've been doing it since the 80s, so perhaps you can learn from my mistakes so you don't have to personally repeat them. Prior to the procedure, uh, my assistant or myself will number the areas of concern for the patient in order of importance so, so that we're sure not to miss the areas they hate the most. During this time, I'll kind of re-review all the risk of the procedure. I downplay very rare things like sores, allergies, and clots. And I emphasize the discoloration, which is not so rare. It usually goes away, but can take a long time and can be permanent. For both, uh, I'll run through my, my approach for reticular veins and then spider veins. For both, I use the, the magnifying polarizing headlight. When you adjust the polarizing setting, as uh, was shown on an earlier slide, you can really see reticular veins that otherwise would not be visible. I do use sterile gloves, not that the procedure stays sterile for very long, but the open glove pack gives my assistant and I a nice sterile place um, to dump all the supplies we need. So although it's not sterile, it's pretty clean and we use alcohol in the skin. The successful treatment of reticular veins is key to treating the overlying spider veins. For retics, my uh, weapon of choice is um, <clears throat> Uh, 0.3% STS. I make it by pulling up a tenth of a cc of the 3% solution and mix it with uh, nine tenths of a cc of sterile water. I attach that to one side of a stopcock and to the other side, I pull back uh, a little more than uh, the three cc syringe holds a little more than the three cc's of uh, gas. So I pull back uh, a little bit more than three cc's of CO2. And so it's not exactly the Tassari method, but it's, it's pretty close. There's a trade-off between a syringe that's nice and smooth to use versus one that holds the stuff in foam longer, uh, depending on what they use to coat the inside of the syringe at the manufacturing plant. So you just have to find a, a brand that you like. That's a good trade-off. Uh, prior to injection, I do the Tassari method of back and forth like the office workers did. Um, and each time before I inject, I refoam the solution. I use a five micron filter attached between the uh, stopcock and a 30 gauge needle um, with the theory being that perhaps as the stuff's going through the micron filter, it'll, the, the, bulb, the um, uh, bubble size will be smaller, though it's hard to prove. This is an example of two puddles of foam that I injected out one minute later. On the left, it's without a filter. On the right, it's with a filter. And I, I'll admit there's not much difference. <clears throat> Prior to placing the needle in the vein, my assistant, who I'm lucky enough to have, uh, pulls the skin in their direction, and I pull the skin with my left hand toward myself and inject with my right hand. Um, I in always, when I'm injecting STS, pull back. Oops, it was supposed to play a video when I did that. But it didn't. Um, if they can run that video, uh, you'll see a flashback of blood in the syringe. And once, the, uh, once I see the blood, I know I'm in the vein, and only then will I inject the STS foam. I'm a little more nervous about extravasation uh, than Dr. Morrison. And so if I feel I've extravasated despite all these uh, antics um, and the patient's having pain, I'll flood the area with about five cc's of uh, lidocaine without epi in attempts of trying to dilute the stuff. After the injection, uh, my assistant with the blue glove there will <clears throat> put on the cotton balls, which will be taped in place. Um, to this end, uh, I always remind patients, please don't put lotion on your leg or even lotion soap or the tape won't stick unless you go all the way around like a tourniquet. 
once the retics have been treated, I treat the spider veins with glycerin. I use a, a glycerin non-chromated solution. I don't like using STS on spider veins. If I've had a patient who's, I've treated a couple times with the glycerin and it's not working, then I'll use a 0.1% liquid STS for the spider veins, but explain to them that there is a higher chance of discoloration and even ulceration. I draw up the uh, glycerin in a five cc syringe. I draw up three and a half cc's of it. And then I mix in a half a cc of lidocaine without epi. I find this makes it a little more comfortable for the patient. Uh, and I don't use a lot of lidocaine because it seems to help the discomfort um, just using a very small amount. And I like to keep the stuff kind of thick because it seems to stick around the spider veins longer. I then attach that five cc syringe, the size port of a stopcock. And to the other port, I do attach a one cc syringe. I know that's um, perhaps blasphemous because it's said that if you use a one cc syringe, you're gonna get a lot of pressure and matting. And I, I respectfully uh, disagree. Uh, while from a physics standpoint, the smaller the area of the plunger, the higher pressure one can exert. Um, if you don't press very hard and you're using a really viscous solution and you're injecting through a 32 or a 33 gauge needle, I don't think it's, too much pressure. If you could run that video, this is me pressing as hard as I possibly can on the syringe, and it doesn't seem to be squirting out under too much pressure. The other reason <clears throat> I use the one cc syringe is if you use a bigger cc, bigger syringe with glycerin, it's really hard to push out through a 33 gauge needle. Another advantage of the one cc syringe is I do all my spider veins with air block technique. I inject a 10th of a cc of air prior uh, to injecting the glycerin because it's really hard to get flashback through a 33 gauge needle. And using one cc syringe makes keeping this little 10th uh, of a cc of air in the right spot of the syringe a little easier than the bigger syringes. In this video, if you could run that please, as soon as the needle goes in, if there's some air there, the vein automatically kind of fills with the air and empties. And it's only then that the glycerin solution is coming down into the vein. Once we've done all the uh, injections, my assistant will apply a compression stocking, 20 to 30 millimeters of mercury above all the cotton balls. I ask them to leave all that stuff on overnight and to get rid of the cotton balls the next day. If you're injecting an area like behind the malleolus, that's kind of concave, the stocking doesn't really press very hard there. So I ask them to retape the cotton balls to that spot to put extra pressure. A spot, another concave spot is behind the knee. It's pretty hard for anyone to retape cotton balls behind their own knee. So I usually have them take an ankle sock and slide it under the stocking, which kind of squishes back there in attempts to keep out that nasty blood. Any discussion of sclerotherapy would be incomplete without a discussion of getting rid of blood that sneaks in despite all your best efforts. Um, this can be done with an 18 gauge needle with or without lidocaine. I've asked many patients, uh, I've tried it both ways with lidocaine, without lidocaine and the exact same patient, hoping someday some will say it hurts less without lidocaine because that would be faster and easier for me, but alas, it hurts less with lidocaine. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Next, we'll have Dr. Stewart, and he'll be talking to us about um, setting expectations for sclerotherapy, which is extremely important, and also complications. Good morning, Vision. I'm happy to be here. So we're going to um, run through this pretty quickly. So with any cosmetic procedure, we all know that patients' memories fade and their expectations are heightened. So before doing any sclerotherapy, I really recommend discussion, just having a discussion with your patient about the expected treatment course. You should review common adverse effects and you should photo document before, during and after treatment. When we close a vein, big or small, the body re reacts with some degree of inflammation. After all, our body doesn't know if the vein closure was intentional or if it was injured. So it reacts with some inflammation. So it's common to have pain at the injection site, some itching, erythema, as well as bruising. Bruising usually resolves in one to two weeks, um, but there's a few things that we can uh, recommend to our patients to speed up this process. One is Arnica. 
Arnica comes from the Arnica Montana plant, and it has an active ingredient, thymol, which causes vasodilation and facilitating uh, more blood flow, flow around the area of treatment can help minimize pain, swelling, and also bruising. Believe it or not, consuming pineapple juice can also help reduce the severity and the duration of bruising. Bromelain, which is con contained in pineapple juice, is an enzyme that has anti-inflammatory properties. Other essential oils that can be uh, placed topically are listed here, and they, can, uh, they also have um, anti-inflammatory properties. So these are the top five adverse effects that are common that every patient needs to know. Failure to close. There's a few things that we can do to set ourselves up for success when we're doing sclerotherapy. The first thing is if you have a patient that has signs or symptoms of underlying venous disease, you should have this patient screened and treated prior to starting your therapy. Second, patients need to understand that the average patch or cluster of spider veins requires an average of three treatments over a period of weeks to months in order for that to resolve and disappear. You also wanna start with low concentrations, uh, low volume, and also low pressure with injection. And it's important sometimes to find the feeder veins in order to be able to maximize uh, your results. Lastly, immediate and prolonged compression is shown to be uh, associated with better cosmetic outcomes. In one study from uh, Dr. Weiss at Johns Hopkins showed that three weeks of post sclerotherapy compression was associated with better um, cosmetic outcomes. Another common local uh, side effect of sclerotherapy is sclerosin induced histamine release resulting in urticaria at the treatment site. This is usually self-limiting, but if patients are symptomatic, you can use some over-the-counter topical corticosteroids. Intravascular or intraluminal hematoma also referred to as coagulum, trapped blood, dead blood, may require uh, puncture aspiration, as we just saw, within two to four weeks of treatment. And this can prevent prolonged inflammation, which can lead to staining. So speaking of staining, I think this is uh, probably the number one complication that patients uh, are dissatisfied with. And up to a third of patients receiving sclerotherapy will develop some form of, of staining. Staining can be uh, due to cell wall lysis at the time of injection or after treatment that leads to red blood cell extravasation and hemosiderin deposition in the dermis. It also can result from trapped blood that causes prolonged inflammation, uh, endothelial damage that again results in red blood cell extravasation and uh, hemosiderin deposition. Uh, typically, this uh, develops about to two to four weeks after the, the, uh, the treatment. The good thing is in 60 to 70% of cases, this will resolve within six months. 90 to 99% of uh, cases will resolve within a year, but this can absolutely, in rare cases, uh, take long time, longer than a year to resolve and sometimes be permanent as well. So who's at risk? Our Fitzpatrick skin types four through six our uh, elderly patients who may have weaker vein walls, uh, our patients that have many allergies or have skin sensitivities and are prone to inflammation, patients with underlying venous reflux, also patients on iron supplementation or on miniocycline, uh, also uh, patients with uh, uh, like hemochromatosis uh, can be more prone to staining, and any patient where the technique is, is not properly done uh, is at risk for staining. So the Eva Mendezes of the world, the Beyonce's of the world, the Michelle Obama's of the world, uh, these are the patients that uh, tend to have a higher uh, propensity to staining. And this is what staining looks like, not overly attractive. So how do we prevent staining? Well, again, we wanna 
go with low concentrations. I know a lot of patients say, give me the high test stuff. It didn't work last time. And that's only going to cause complications. So you want to go low concentrations, low volumes, uh, immediate compression, prolonged compression, and then you want really timely follow-up. So every patient should have probably follow-up within two weeks, maybe three. Um, that way, if there's any trapped blood, you can uh, express that. Some people uh, request like bleaching agents or exfoliants. Actually, uh, bleaching agents uh, have not been shown to really be effective with staining. It, exfoliants can only make the, the area worse. Some heat treatment may have minimal uh, um, effect on reducing staining, but they're expensive. For patients with significant staining or prolonged staining, you can try deferoxamine injections. Uh, this uh, chelates the iron to ferrioxamine, which is a more water-soluble um, form. And you can try to apply some licor uh, licorice root extract. It has uh, anti-inflammatory properties that can inhibit tyrosinase and that uh, suppresses melanogenesis. So our last common uh, side effect uh, with sclerotherapy is, is matting. These are the fine red feathery uh, vessels that appear about a month after treatment. Uh, we see this in up to 20% of patients that receive sclerotherapy. Typically, this goes away in about a year. So the thing you want to uh, talk with your patients about is just being patient. So again, treating this is, is really difficult because it's such a fine, uh, uh, thin vessel. You can try omic therapy or IPL laser, um, but usually these will end up resolving on their own. Here's some examples of matting. And we don't know what's causing this. This could be angiogenesis, or this could be uh, vascular congestion due to the, the vein obstruction as a result of sclerotherapy. So a few salient points here. Again, uh, discuss the expected treatment process with your, your patients. Definitely uh, review all of those common side effects uh, so they know uh, what can be in store. Identify high-risk patients. Um, and then you, again, use low pressure, uh, low volume, uh, low concentrations. You can dial it up safely if you need to. And then immediate compression and prolonged compression uh, with, with good follow-up and a good uh, photographic documentation. So we're gonna really quickly run through uh, some rare but more serious side effects of sclerotherapy. Most of these side effects in my experience uh, result when you're using uh, or performing foam sclerotherapy. It's much less likely with liquid sclerotherapy. Allergic reactions, uh, this, is, this is an estimate that uh, STS one out of 1,000 and polydocanol one out of 10,000 can have an allergic reaction. Um, there has been some anaphylaxic deaths as a result of using these uh, detergent uh, sclerosants. Typically, these are hypersensitivity reactions, so they'll occur with repeat exposure. And one thing to look out for, if you're doing sclerotherapy and your patient uh, develops uh, systemic itching or uh, urticaria or even abdominal pain, these can be clues that they're very sensitive and you may want to either discontinue sclerotherapy or change your uh, sclerosant. Visual disturbances and migraines, depending on which study you read, this can be 1% uh, up to 14%. Again, this is seen much more, uh, in my experience, with uh, foaming reticular veins and also uh, varicosities. DVTs, again, different studies uh, show DVT rates with sclerotherapy up to six, 10%. Again, in my experience, this is more common with uh, foam sclerotherapy when your target vein is a little bit uh, bigger in size. And then stroke, uh, there's been about 13 documented cases in the past 30 years. Uh, I, four of these cases involved liquid sclerotherapy. So it, it can occur. Um, it usually occurs uh, immediately. So the neurological deficit uh, occurs immediately after treatment. And uh, the cause uh, in those four cases is, is really unclear. Good thing most of these all resolved. And tissue necrosis, this can occur a few different ways. Um, extravasation of a, a higher concentration of sclerosant uh, has the potential of causing tissue necrosis locally. 
uh, ischemic necrosis if uh, you inject directly into an artery or indirectly through like an AVM. And uh, there's been a case of pyoderma gangrenosum documented as well after uh, uh, visual sclerotherapy. With uh, tissue necrosis, the, in my experience, um, it's more common if you're doing visual sclerotherapy over bony prominences. Uh, and luckily we're using a lower concentration to target these smaller veins. Uh, and at low concentrations, extravasation usually does not occur, uh, or I'm sorry, extravasation can occur, but it does not result in, uh, in wounds and tissue necrosis. If patients do develop tissue necrosis, the main thing you want to let them know is that this will typically heal over 90 days. There's going to be usually a, an acceptable cosmetic uh, scarf. Um, and the main uh, concern during this period of healing, obviously, is infection. And that's it. So thank you, guys. Thank you. And I'd like to welcome back to the podium Dr. Elias from um, the director of Center um, for Vein Disease in Inglewood Health in New Jersey. And he's gonna discuss how he chooses between foam and fulvectomy for tributary veins. Okay, thank you. Uh, but before that, I'm gonna finish my last talk, which was going to be about new technologies and what else do I think we need? That was the second part of the talk. I think, and I didn't, I purposely did not do it at that time because this is what we need. What we just heard about sclerotherapy and treating the tiniest of veins. Okay, it is, you know, counterintuitive to think we do great jobs on big veins. We don't do as good a job on the tiniest of veins. So, you know, patients think, oh, these are little veins. Why can't you take care of it? Give me somebody that has a, you know, total iliac occlusion. And you open it up. They're like thrilled. They get great results. Where do we need to go? We need to find a better way to manage uh, spider veins and uh reticular veins, et cetera, the smallest veins. That's why I think we're really lacking in the in the vein world. And you just heard uh, talk about how to minimize those things, but none of us are like thrilled 95% of the time treating patients with small veins. We really wish we could do a better job for them and for us. Um, so I'm given to, you know, when do you decide to do sclerotherapy versus excision of varicosities? And now this kind of piggybacks onto uh, Marlon's talk as to, you know, do you stage it? Do you not stage it and stuff? In general, for many, many years, most people know I was a stager. My patient population, they're happy to have something done that in general, more than 50% of the time, they're not going to need anything else done if you wait long enough. And that's the first thing. If the varicot, you have to tell the patient, it's going to be at least six weeks up to two to three months to see the full effect of your axial ablation before, if you're going to wait, you got to wait at least that, that long in, in my mind. And as Marlon pointed out, and my feeling too, in general, they're going to get, most of them are not going to need anything done. But if they do, the veins will get small enough that you'll be doing sclerotherapy rather than um, phlebectomy. But there is a role for phlebectomy at some point. And obviously, 10 to 15% of the people we see may have just large veins and no axial reflux. So they may need something done directly to the varicosities. So you asked me to say, how do I decide? My primary factors are really the size of the vein. Uh, where they're located on, on the leg and what the patient's expectations are. Are they doing it for symptom relief? Are they doing it for cosmetic improvement? And also your own personal experience. How many people here are doing ultrasound guided foam sclerotherapy? And how many are doing phlebectomy? Okay, good. How many are doing more foam sclerotherapy than phlebectomy? How many are doing more phlebectomy than foam sclerotherapy? Okay, 50-50 for everything. Um, so what do I mean by size and location? Compression is an important part of kind of both the things that we do, um, but maybe more so if you're going to put foam into a, into a, a varicosity. So in my mind, an area where you can get some good compression, and that's kind of from the knee down or the lower thigh down, may push you a little more towards doing foam sclerotherapy with a vein that's slightly larger. Up in the groin area, it's very hard. I'm not talking about neovascularization. I'm talking about varicosities, primary varicosities. Up in the, in the groin area, it's kind of hard to get really good compression, even if you put compression stockings on or compression pantyhose. A lot of studies have shown they really don't do much at all in terms of compressing those veins. 
those areas I might more consider to remove. And sometimes I'll do a combination of, of foam kind of in the lower from the half mid thigh down and maybe excise some of the ones up above because you like to tie at least I do I like to tie them off up in the groin because you can't get that good of uh, of compression so anyhow the point is um, location is one thing that you need to think about what are some of the secondary obviously the patient's body habitus their skin color as we already heard uh, certain skin types are more prone to uh, staining and to pigmentation more pigmentation and what does the patient what's their perception you know a couple of little tiny incisions or do they want they want nothing and also what has been their experience previously somebody comes to you and say you know i, I had a phlebectomy and it was terrible oh my god then you may want to push yourself if it's the right situation to do scleral or vice versa. Indications are also another uh, thing that determines which way I may go. Cosmesis, are they doing it for symptoms? Uh, is it a combination of issues? Advanced disease in general, um, you know, it's hard to excise obviously varicosities in an area of lipodermatosclerosis in the lower third of the leg. So that's going to push you more towards the uh, foam sclerotherapy. Uh, that's another thing. So in advanced disease, you have a patient here with ulcer. Obviously, if there are varicosities there, you're going to foam those. You're not going to go out and, uh, and remove them. Although you may, if they're really larger up above, remove the ones higher up above the level of lipodermatosclerosis and inject the ones lower down. Here's a patient with the KTS and they've had a couple of ulcers and open wounds you can see on the bottom of their posterior calf. You don't wanna go digging around in that. So again, that may push you more towards doing um, sclerotherapy. Again, what, what do I consider the best scenario for sclerotherapy? It's just my own personal thing. The lower leg, leg is um, lower thigh, the, the feet in general, I don't like to excise because of the uh, uh, sensory nerves in that area, obviously in the periulsa area and neovascularization, those are really good indications. And the size of the veins. Um, somebody else showed a, uh, a slide about the size of the veins in, in general, underneath the five millimeters, I'll consider more leaning towards the sclerotherapy and above five millimeters, I really think about uh, removing the veins. Although we've seen, I don't know if any of you have seen, but Paul Pitaluga from France shows really nice pictures of excising reticular veins and not sclerosing it, uh, whatever. Every, it's, it's whatever works best in your hands. I'm not excising reticular veins. Um, and again, I made the point about post-ablation, you really need to wait <clears throat> before you want to decide what to do. So this is an area here where I would consider sclerotherapy is a good location uh, for this type of patient. Lobectomy, what's the best scenario? As I already told you, upper thigh, maybe the popliteal fossa. It's hard to get compression there or you get intermittent compression because the patient's bending their legs. So you're going to have a compression, not compression, compression, not compression. Obviously, larger veins, I certainly tend more towards, uh, towards excision and increased BMI because I think it's just that the, the pressure uh, and whether they're symptomatic or cosmetic. Symptomatic, I might be pushed if everything else fits the criteria to removing the varicosity versus uh, if they're doing it for cosmetic reasons. Also timing, we already spoke about that. In general, it is very, very rare. I do it at the same time after having a discussion with the patients. Most patients will say, well, you're telling me I've got a 50 or 60% chance I'm not going to need anything done. I, why do you, doctor, why do you want to do something 50, 60% of the time that you don't need to do at the same time to do the ablation? And Although we saw the paper from England, some patients want like do everything at once. I don't want to have to come back or whatever. Most, at least in my area, most patients really elect to just stage it. And then obviously there's insurance issues as well. So there are outliers. Some people only do sclerotherapy and I'm glad most of you do both. And some people only do excision. Again, no matter how small, and I spoke to you about Paul Pitaluga's ideas about reticular veins. Um, so at some point though, sclerotherapy does become an operation. You saw the, uh, 18 gauge. I use a 21 gauge, David, you're a little nastier to your patients. I use a 21 gauge. I can squeeze it out through the 21, try a 21 maybe without, without, without xylocaine. Um, 
And at some point, phlebectomy may, may also, you may need to touch up with sclerotherapy. So it's not either or. And that's where I'm, I'm heading here. I think you need to have the concept that these are complementary. In other words, on one, on a patient, you may be doing both. And the great majority of the time, if they're kind of in that gray area, they have some that are larger, some that are smaller, different locations, they can be complementary. And also at some point, sclerotherapy, it can be, you think of it as sclerotherapy assisted phlebectomy or phlebectomy assisted sclerotherapy. And you can get maximum results and, and minimize the complications. Um, there really is no data. They really, the experience in your training is what, what kind of you can decide. People will show you great pictures of both. People will show you complications of both, but you obviously got to figure out what's working best for you. I just kind of gave you uh, my ideas and I'm glad you're all uh, proficient in, in both. Uh, Raghu Kalori and others have, have combined sclerotherapy and phlebectomy in this varicosity you're going to do, you're going to excise. They'll do, phlebec they'll do sclerotherapy first, get the foam in there. So if you miss a few veins or whatever, um, and also it, it causes them spasm and, and accompanied by the tumescence, uh, and then um, they get less post-procedures. Uh, post Where I think we're going though, is because as, as non-thermals and non-tumescence get more and more popular, it's if you're doing the axial vein, without any tumescence, then you got to give tumescence for the varicosities for phlebectomy. I think more and more people honestly are going to go to the staging, waiting and seeing what happens for that reason. And clearly we everybody's getting reimbursed. If you do your work in the office, less money, maybe phlebectomy is not worth it at this point uh, to, to, re to really do it. So I already spoke to you about something um, completely different. And that was HIFU. And maybe next time I speak to you, we'll have some better results with that too. I invite you all to look at venusedge.com. It's a new video online magazine that, that, that we have. It's free. Sign up. It's all supported by industry. And I think you'll find exciting what we offer there. So thank you. Panel discussion. I want to thank all of the speakers up here uh, this morning and thank you guys. Um, we do have a little bit of time to open up the floor for any questions. Dr. Pappas. So thank you everyone. That was a really excellent um, uh, session. So my frustration is with the telangiectetic matting. You mentioned that Sean, and you said that you want to wait, but a lot of the patients, it just really bugs them and they don't want to wait. So is there any role for omic therapy in telangiectetic matting? I have no personal experience with it. I haven't seen any literature on it. So I don't know if, if, if laser therapy for telangiectetic matting actually works or not. Some, some of my patients say they've tried it, they've had no experience. What's the panel's feeling about laser therapy for matting? A, a, quick, a quick point with matting, um, we do see this in more obese patients. We also uh, tends to be more common in patients that are on estrogen. So some people recommend taking patients off estrogen prior to treatment uh, for two to four weeks and resume after uh, the sclerotherapy. Um, anybody have any experience treating matting? Vinny and I would just, would just be, first of all, I'll say the omic therapy, Peter, I have a vein going in the office, it uh, doesn't work for, for the matting. Um, but, and Vinny will, will exp expand on this, but um, there is, a, for, I have a couple of good laser dermatologists in my area and I do send the patients there and they do fairly well. After waiting, the, you know, I'm not gonna send them after three weeks or something like that. Uh, I have to wait at least six months or so, and they'll either use IPO or some other one. So yeah, Vinit, he does this. So why don't you explain? Sure. Yeah. So your options for the treatment of matting is twofold. You can do an IPL intense pulse light. Um, the advantage is that you have a larger footprint, so you can cover a larger area faster. Your fluence has to be much higher, so you can actually target and destroy those vessels. Um, if you have a patient who has darker skin, uh, then you really can't use the IPL or if they're tanned because you could actually cause dyschromia and other issues as well and burn the skin. Um, if you have a pulse dye laser, 585, 595, or a KTP, which is a 532, um, you can really target those fine veins. Uh, once again, if you have a darker skin patient or a tan patient, 
um, an ND YAG you can't use because it, the, the beam goes too deep into the dermis. So you're not gonna actually treat the matting. So ideally, if the patient is tanned, you wanna have them come back when they're not tanned um, and then treat them. But the pulse dye or KTP laser will do awesome. Um, and IPL will do great. IPL is very faster and more efficient um, and less painful. Yes. So Vineet bring is a perfect example of who you need to befriend <laughs> in your, no, I'm being really serious about this. Um, and you work in tandem with each other. You don't want a dermatologist that has one laser that they think they can treat everything with. You need someone who has a few at their disposal so they can decide what's correct for the patient. So I encourage you to reach out to those people in your area you need a laser dermatologist that's really well-versed in this. That's what I do, Peter, to help this. So Vinny, can you just expand upon this a little bit? Are you limited in terms of the dose that you can give and the area that you can treat? So I've, I've been told that you can only give a certain amount of pulses per, per quadrant. So can you just expand upon that a little bit? Yeah, so for laser physics, if you're using an NDAG laser, so that's your 1064 long pulse, you cannot pulse stack, which means that you can't hit the same place twice. If you will, if you do, you'll put a hole in the skin immediately and you'll, you'll cause scarring. Um, if the patient is, com is coming in for matting or even smaller, finer veins, um, you can treat as many pulses as you want with a KTP or um, a pulse dye laser. There's no limit. Um, in theory, once you treat a vessel appropriately, you don't need to go back and double treat it. Um, you could, you could, and there's two different ways to treat. You can either treat with what we call as purpuric settings, where you really get purpura from it, which is basically obliteration of the vein. Um, not as elegant. Uh, I prefer for my endpoint to be blanching. Uh, but having said that, the only uh, limitations you have is that if you use an NDAG laser, you don't want to pulse stack. You can treat that site, go to the next site, come back to it if you need to. But yes, be careful because you can cause problems. You know, if the patient um, is tanned or darker skin, then be very careful. Lower fluences uh, for those types of patients. Uh, dyschromia, likewise, is super tough to treat. Um, in those patients, you can use a picosecond laser if you have one, um, but you know, time is probably the best for dyschromia. And finally, the last question I get tortured with all the time is when you do get staining, all the patients want some kind of cream or salve that they can put on it. Is there anything that works other than, I mean, I don't want to treat myself, you know, because so is there anything you can uh, say to the patient that does help with the staining in terms of a cream or salve? Unfortunately, topically, you don't get deep into where the actual issue is. So your outcomes are very poor. I mean, there's been some studies that you can do a combination of kojic acid, absorbic acid, and so forth. But we use it more for melasma on the face as opposed to doing it for legs. And that also for like epidermal, you know, type melasma. So once again, this is a dermal type phenomenon. You will not get much improvement. Uh, in this case, ideally, you want to use a picosecond based laser because a picosecond based laser is a mechanical disruption of the actual pigment. And that disruption of the pigment causes the macrophages to come in and actually eat up the pigments that's in the dermis. Uh, but once again, a picosecond laser is time consuming. Um, there's different types as well. They're very expensive to have. Um, and I would almost say that unless it's a small, small patch, it's not even worth to go down that road and creams, um, hydroquinone and so forth, just don't, just don't do it. And they can cause irritation. Um, once again, if the skin is inflamed, if you add more inflammation, that just creates more complications, um, and just have your patients save their money. Thank you. Um, with respect to matting, I'll say something else that may be controversial and perhaps just adding insult to injury. But if you can find a tiny, tiny little vein in the midst of all that stuff and get it with a 33 gauge needle and glycerin, it seems to work. Can I make a comment? You absolutely may. So in regards to matting, uh, what I have noticed is there are two types of mattings. One is inflow matting, the other one is obstructive matting. What you may want to do is look with your ultrasound. If there is an inflow trib, which is feeding that matting, and if you use foam injection in that inflow, 
you will have tremendous success treating that matting. If there is no tributary superficial, you know, like a, uh, a dermal uh, trib I'm talking about, if there is none, then it may be worth treating with a laser, like a KTP 532 wavelength laser. And that's the way I do it. And I'm very successful in treating matting. And as far as uh, creams are concerned, it's more for hemosiderin stain and using the 532 wavelength KTP laser is very successful for um, the hemosiderin staining. And within a session or two, sometimes I'll combine the 532 wavelength with a 1064 uh, ND YAG laser at the same time in the same session. And actually, sorry, not the 1064, but the 755 Alexandrite laser along with the 532 KTP laser works like a charm. When one session, I will get rid of the hemosiderin stain very effectively. Thank you. Thank you. You're right. So you can, you can blend them. I will say that the blending of the lasers is tricky as well uh, for the right patient type. Um, if someone is Hispanic, Persian, Indian, uh, it can be, you can cause more detriment. Or if a patient is in Marlin's backyard, who's, you know, out in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, that can be very tricky. Um, keep in mind that we're talking about long pulse versus short pulse. Short pulse lasers, if you have that, is what really targets the pigment. Um, and that's your picosecond lasers and so forth, uh, your nanoseconds. But your long pulse is the one that targets the vessels. So when we're talking about these types of lasers, um, the differentiation is that if you're, you're trying to treat pigment, ideally, if you have a short pulse as opposed to long pulse, uh, therefore, you have a more targeted approach. But yes, you can use a KTP laser, target pigment, short term, make it a bit darker than it should disintegrate. But once again, it's a lot of hand holding and it's very tricky as well. Do not recommend it for the beginners. Thank you. I think that's oh, Dr. Uh, Moore. Yes, uh, Keith Moore, Atlanta. Uh, any recommendations on hand veins? Hand veins? Yes, hand veins stay away from them to remove them, but you can do hand restoration, which is, what's the problem? Is it that the veins are too big or that the subcutaneous, the patients lost their subcutaneous tissue? The ladies just don't like them. No, I understand that, but I'm saying <laughs> the, the, um, the ladies, men may not like it either, but no, the really, the, the, in general, it's not that the veins are so large. Some of them are, yes, we've seen patients, but it's really that the women and more women, you're right, than men, have lost their subcutaneous tissue. So hand restoration is really putting fillers in between the veins of the hand. And I've actually uh, done this um, about three years ago with the, did it, and some patients were extremely happy, but the, the, they did look good. Many people will show putting these little laser fibers into the hand veins. And yes, there's great pictures. I just don't, I think the opposite way is where I would start first. What do you? So just a comment, there is, so MERS um, has actually like a hand aging scale. Um, and one of my talks, I wish I had my slide deck, I can show it to you, it's really cool, uh, goes through and talks with the aging hand and it grades at zero through four. Um, so there's two ways to approach hands. One is that you treat the veins or do you treat the sub -Q loss and so forth and all the sun damage um, that's on the skin itself. Uh, radius is approved for, in, for injection into the hand. And that I've actually treated a lot of hands. And um, I think that patients uh, find it to be very, they're very happy with the results. It's sustainable, it's durable. Um, you know, obviously you have to inject in the right um, plane so that you're not going into the vessels or tendons or you're not going too superficially where you get more of the nodularity. Um, yes, you can treat the veins as well. I I prefer to treat with radius for the hands as opposed to treating the veins itself, just because I think that the issue is volume loss as opposed to the veins. And then you can treat the skin and improve the hands. Because I agree with you, if the face looks good, the hand doesn't look good, then it gives away the age you know, for the patient a second. Uh, 